Hi, Michael. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you? Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my pleasure. Okay. So um, I was just saying um, to uh, the people that are online over here. So one week is now going to be the third movie that we're showing as part of Canadian National Canadian Film Day. And Excellent. doing it online like this is really a, a brand new experience for me. And I wasn't exactly sure what to expect from it. Um, you know, running a festival, one of the things that I always enjoy is having that group in the theater and sure. uh, going off of that vibe because there's definitely like a charge in the air, I think, in, in an experience like that. So I wasn't sure what, to, what it was going to be like over here, but it's actually pretty damn good. Uh, like we've been interacting <laughs> online and chatting and um, it's, it's not so bad. Anyway. Good. Well, that's good. Yeah. So, Michael, first of all, thank you so much for uh, taking the time and joining us um, on oh, my pleasure. Q&A Absolutely. before your movie. I just want to start and read to you some comments, some feedback that I got from people on our social media challenge, uh, social media channels about one week. Just a few, if you bear with me. Sure. So, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, somebody by the name of Out Beyonder, he said, I saw this movie for the first time many years ago in India and it stayed with me. Being a motorcyclist myself and having gone through similar life-altering events, I connected with the film in more ways than one. Tanya writes, I love this film. At the time it came out, I was trying to decide if I should leave my Nova Scotia home and head to Alberta for a few years for work and adventure. I left the theater that day knowing I was going to make the move. She also said that she had her um, wallpaper on her screen was the rolled up Tim Hortons cup <laughs> <laughs> that said, go West. Um, Stuart says, I've seen this film about a dozen times. I own my own copy and everyone I've recommended it to also loved it. Even non motorcycle people, a must see for, for every Canadian. And lastly, Sean said, I wrote this loop based on the movie. I left from Gardner in Toronto, then went, down, then went west. Three weeks, 11,000 kilometers, no need to dream about it. I had mentioned that that would be a dream of mine to do that, that sort of a trip. He said, just pack three pairs of underwear in a backpack and bring an empty credit card. So <laughs> this movie has resonated with a lot of people. And you wrote and directed this movie. So can you talk to us a little bit about how that came about? Uh, I mean, it, when I was probably about Ben's age, I had a scare with being sick. Nothing serious, but it sort of made me question my own mortality. Um, I was a teacher for a year and sort of so I could relate. I didn't ride a motorcycle, but I wanted to do sort of an homage to Canada. And, you know, how could you do that and what would you know, what would it look like? And that's sort of the, the genesis of starting it. And when I was writing this movie, I, there's usually three acts to a film and the first act is about 20 minutes. And I always got to that first act and was Ben has cancer, then he would go on his trip. And it, I couldn't write the movie because it then just became a different movie after that. And then when I, and so I was stuck for months on, on writing this script. And then when I had the idea of like, basically the first scene is you've got cancer and you're screwed, that really allowed me to when I figured out to do it not after the first act but right to start the movie essentially it really freed me up to write it and I wrote it very quickly after that it it, it came a lot easier so it was just, it was funny because it was a script that I actually didn't think I'd ever finish because I just couldn't figure out how to do it and, and then, then it came so easily when I sort of figured out how to do it that way mm -hmm. are you a motorcycle rider I'm not there's a picture which I'll get it in a second of my cousin at my cousin's farm where I learned to ride a dirt bike. But uh, I, I had a lot of accidents on the dirt bike, uh, nothing serious, but I, I wasn't a motorcycle rider. The, the Norton and that, that we shot with on the last day of filming um, the guy that owned it, Malcolm was like, do you want to ride the, do you want to ride it? I was like, yeah, sure. And the, uh, the props person was like, this is going to be a huge mistake, but uh, I, I, I managed not to, to, to fall over on it. So why, why did you choose the motorcycle as the vehicle to tell the story? Like, why not? Why couldn't Ben have gone on a car trip out west? Yeah, I mean, he, I think there's a romance to getting on a bike 
that I, there's a freedom and there's a, there's a certain amount of, I don't say danger, but just there's a, it, sort of, it says something about the character that he would get on a, on a motorcycle and do that. And it felt better than getting in a car or getting on a bicycle or, or, you know, if you put him on a bike, it's going to take forever to get out there. If, if he walks or in, in a car, just didn't feel like it was the same immediacy to the world around him that the motorcycle gave him. Yeah, I agree. I think there is some danger to it for sure. Um, yeah. But there's also some, a lot of freedom that comes with it as well. And well, connectedness and, and, with the environment. Yeah. And I think that the, it's a feeling of being, I mean, he wanted to feel fully alive and I don't think you'd, you get that dramatically as as much in a car or anything else. So yeah, that's one of the reasons. Yeah. How did you choose all of these iconic locations throughout Canada? You know, the world's largest and then a list of <laughs> yeah. paperclip, hockey stick, so on, so on. It was one of those ones that I was afraid it was really a stupid idea when I was writing it. Uh, it was like, this is just too, not gimmicky, but it, it, it sort of, it was offbeat and quirky enough that I, it amused me. And then, you know, it sort of passed the test of the readers that I, I like to, to vet my scripts with and stuff like that. And then it just was something that it felt uniquely Canadian. It probably isn't, but it just sort of, and it also sort of gave him a bit of a roadmap. I mean, we had to cheat it a bit. The hockey stick was actually in Duncan and uh, not North of Manitoba, but, and I think there was one there, but we, for whatever reasons we couldn't i can't really quite remember but i we couldn't go up there for just for our, our schedule but when we showed the film in victoria i remember somebody like which is so duncan's like 20 minutes away from victoria somebody was sort of saying hey like that's our that's our arena that wasn't a manitoba yeah. and i said i said well actually there's a, a, <laughs> an exact a hockey stick outside of uh Winnipeg that, and they're like really I was like no no but I said sometimes we have to cheat things in, we have to cheat things in film so artistic leeway it's called I think right well <laughs> uh, you know sometimes they uh they shoot films in Toronto uh for Hollywood and all these that's right. things yes it was a bit of art artistic leeway that's right excellent um so I think it added something at least for us Canadians it added something to the story because uh we probably a lot, most of us have gone on road trips with our parents uh you know as kids and have seen these sort of things and uh it made it relatable so I liked it mm -hmm. a lot um so two things in the movie two extra things in the movie that really jumped out first of all the Stanley Cup how did you manage to get your hands on the Stanley Cup in that movie what a coup yeah it, it, it's sort of even looking back on it it seems sort of ridiculous that we got it but we just asked <laughs> and they said yes and some guy came with the stanley cup and uh we it, we had a great day i mean it's such an iconic trophy and there is some kind of i don't know like totematic or whatever power to it so yeah we asked and they came so it was really weird that they said yes but they did because it was a little movie and i don't know quite what our story that we spun with them was but they bought it and brought it so it was great and was it a guy in white gloves who brought it yeah absolutely oh uh, really yeah yeah like it was the stanley cup and the whole oh, thing wow. and uh and they had certain rules like you weren't allowed to lift it over your head if you hadn't if you hadn't won the cup and stuff like that they they nobody did but they adhered to that but they they were great i mean the people that are sort of the guardians or custodians of the cup understand what what a, what attraction and power it has to people, and they're really good at like a com like we needed to get what we needed to get done for production. But then there was like a team there that got their picture with it. Lots of people brought, you know, friends and family that day. I brought my son and my dad, so it was it, they were great about that kind of stuff. Amazing, amazing. Um, the other thing is Gord Downey. So, you know, he makes the, the cameo in the movie. And uh, it was interesting when I saw the movie years ago. And now I just rewatched it a couple of days ago as a refresher. And uh, seeing it again and seeing Gord, um, I don't know. There was, again, something really special about that moment. Um, brought back a lot of memories. Um, can you talk a little bit about your experience working with, with Gord and, and how that came about? With Gord, I had written a screen, like a, my first film, My Dog Vincent, that we wanted him to play a, a role. And it was a really little, it was basically like a student film. And somebody had gave him the script, somebody that, I don't know how they knew him, 
and we finished filming and then I got this call like six months later and said, Hey, it's Gord Downey. And I thought somebody was sort of kidding and it was him and he was really nice. I mean, obviously we didn't put him in the movie because we shot it. And then when I did St. Ralph, um, I had this idea of him performing Hallelujah and I approached him about it. We did this mm. or, or, orchestral version of it and, and he was nice enough to do it. So, and I kind of knew him a bit. He's a really, was a really generous person. And I, had this idea that he'd play this part and approached him and, and he was into it. And it was interesting when he was on set. I mean, cause here's, you know, one of our truly, I was one of our truly iconic Canadians and he was so wanted to do such a good job and was ner like truly nervous. I'm like, you're going to be great. You have nothing really? to worry about. Wow. And, That's uh, so surprising. Yeah. Yeah. Totally humble. And, uh, and just great. And then, you know, obviously with what happened to him, there was some, you know, weird, terrible, you know, not prophecy because it was a diff it was completely different, but there was something in there that resonates differently, obviously, now that, that he's he's gone. Yeah, yeah, it's taken on a different meaning. Yeah, it's amazing. It's surprising to hear that he was nervous about, um, you know, being filmed, given the fact that he's played, you know, arena-sized concerts, so amazing. Yeah, and that's it. Uh, that's the thing about him. He wanted, he, he got out of his, he wanted to get out of his comfort zone and, and he, he really thought he did a terrible job. And I'm like, <laughs> I was having a hard time convincing that he was, hmm. he was awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so in the movie, uh, Ben comes across two females, two strong females uh, who, I don't know, I think they've, he, in the movie, Ben mentions that he's looking for moments to experience moments. And he comes across these two strong females, the first one being um, the lady who rescues him when his bike, bike breaks down. Um, and then the second one is the, the camper in, in Banff. So um, what was the purpose of that, um, I guess? Like, what were they teaching Ben? So that's a question. And then the second part, I guess, is the, the first lady who helps him with the breakdown and ends up uh, fixing his bike. I got to say, that's that was probably very progressive still is um i think to have like a female mechanic so it's fantastic so how did that come about and what's the story behind that well i want him to like i mean he was running away from his life and one of the things that he was running away from was this impending marriage and would he settle and even though he, he could think of all the reasons why he should and so I wanted to, him to meet and ex not that he hadn't, but sort of put that relationship in contrast with others that he met along the road. And certainly the, the, the prairie farmer woman uh, was much different. And, and I wanted her to be sort of as different from uh, Samantha as could be. And then, you know, meeting the, the carefree unsettled person was a different version. So they're almost like different lives he could have led. And, uh, and that's sort of what, I, as his journey sort of unfolded, they weren't the right ones, but they were possibilities and sort of made him question, you know, what Samantha was to him even further. All right. Okay. Um, one of the questions that we got from um, one of the other indie directors from one of the shorts that we showed earlier today is what is your perspective on um, the Canadian filmmaking landscape? You're still making movies. You're still acting as a director, TV and cinema. So what is it, what's it like and how has it changed since let's say 08 when one week came out? Uh, I mean, it's changed every, it's changed dramatically. I mean, in, in, in COVID will change it even more. I mean, it's harder and harder because of what streaming services do for for the theatrical release. Uh, I mean, I've been lucky enough to have made a number of films and every time you make one, you consider yourself lucky. And I don't think it ever gets easier. And having said that though, there's, there is, we're lucky in Canada, there is a system that, 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 that encourages and supports it. Uh, that's not market entirely market driven. So, like, for example, when I did when St. Ralph came out, I went on a week. Like we had multi, we sold all over the world, multiple offers in Japan. And, you know, I, I ended up doing a bunch of press in Japan. It was a big success there. So when we came out with one week, I was telling, telling, asking the salesperson, are you expecting a sale in Japan? And, and the person's like, 
that market is gone. So even sort of between those years, and when you first started, you'd always you sort of went with the looked at Clerks or Brothers McMullen or Reservoir Dogs and thought, okay, well, this is we're the little films that could can explode. And it's not to say that they can't anymore, but I think those are even it was hard before, but it's it's even harder as the marketplace changes. Having said that, the idea of the streaming service is that you, you know, you could do a film and show it on Netflix. You probably end up having way more people see it in, in, if it gets the attention that you hope it does. So it's just, it, it's different. And as you're saying, like the theatrical, like having people in the room, the theatrical experience um, has changed somewhat. I mean, there's obviously still festivals in that, but you know, we just don't go to see as many indie films as we had five years ago, 10 years ago, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, my, from my perspective, th definitely it's changed. Um, let's say back in 08 or maybe 09, if I remember correctly, that's when I think like digital, like DSLR started to, be, to come out and probably somewhere around there, maybe a little bit later, they were, all of a sudden it seems to me that there was like this influx of more content being produced. And, uh, and so that probably made things difficult, at least for uh, film festivals to choose. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For the, so, so when we did, when I did my first film, like the cost of entry is, you know, is, is relatively high because editing suites, film stock, all those things like cameras, everything was, relatively expensive now you can make a film obviously on your iphone so it's free and so the democratization of film has been fantastic the downside of that is there's you know a an abundance of content that yeah. is harder to find an audience and rise above it so yeah. you know it's true and you've got more places where maybe you can put that content like uh, let's begin with something simple like youtube or vimeo or go up to you know netflix and prime but even there unless it's got the right attention unless you can attract that audience it's so easy for it to get lost on those platforms just buried under all of that content so it's difficult i'm sure yeah yeah it's never been an easy business and it's never I don't like that's a lot more people want to do it than than get lucky enough to do it. So that will, yeah, the and the, and the our attention pie is sort of cut in way more pieces than it ever has been for for our entertainment. Yeah. yeah. Um, Michael, what's next for you? What are you working on now, or what's coming up in the horizon? Um, I'm hoping to shoot. Uh, Mar I don't know if you know Miriam Taze's book, All My Puny Sorrows. Um, so that that's a it's a fantastic book and we're we're hopefully close to shooting that as soon as this all ends yeah did you already start that or like at what stage is it we haven't started shooting but we're okay. we're, we're 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 close to going yeah where is the where's the industry at the moment is everything just completely i know like i've had family who works for the studios down in la and they're all just sitting at home twiddling thumbs uh, where is what's happening in the industry right now? What, what's everyone doing? Well, there were every. I mean, if you're a content creator, you can still write, you can still develop, you can still pitch. But you know, for crew in Toronto, they're saying right now they're not issuing film permits until June 30th. So you, even if you thought, okay, I, I feel like it's safe to do it, you can't. You're legally not allowed to do it, and so. Uh, and you can't get insurance or anything like that. So it's it's really a wait and see as to when it, we can go back. I mean, I read today that Netflix, there's they there's uh, filming in South Korea and Iceland, and they're sort of looking at best practices for that. So hmm. hopefully it will be sooner rather than later that we can yeah. get back to work. Yeah. And how have you been coping and managing? It's fine. I mean, like, uh, you know, I have nothing, relatively speaking, to complain about. And uh because i can write um i i can still work and you know dream of worlds but if you're there's so many people like in every industry that you just that it's it's tough so i i feel fortunate and um yeah it's it's been fine 
Well, I feel fortunate that you agreed to join us on this Q&A discussion. Thank you so very much for that. Um, oh, it's been my pleasure. Thanks, thanks for asking me. Um, I was around tonight, so it's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, me too. I'm not going anywhere. So here I am. Um, anyway, thank you again so much. Um, so we, everyone on our uh, TMFF community, we're all going to jump over to Prime at 930. And we're going to all watch uh, one week together and the uh, chat online using hashtag TMFF cinema. Thank you again so much, uh, Michael, and wish you okay, all the best. Take care. You, likewise. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.